The largest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine took place on February 6, 2023, in the relatively unknown city of Volodar, and ended in the Russian armed forces losing a devastating 130 tanks and armored infantry fighting vehicles during an intense three-week-long battle. Retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis said Russia's making the same tactical errors and mistakes in ways that they should already know don't work. For instance, this is the same mistake Russian forces made in Bucha early in the war near Kyiv, sending armored columns straight into an ambush. Why can't the Russian army get their infantry, tanks, artillery, and air assets all working synchronized together in combined arms warfare? Why is Putin throwing wave after wave of soldiers at Volodar? Is it even strategically important? There are four different reasons that I think are contributing to the repeated mistakes in the Russian army that we'll investigate, including direct competition between units, no sharing of standard operating procedures, new Ukrainian artillery tactics and munition types, and a loss of Russian leadership. We're going to look into analyzing that and much more in this video. The city of Volodar has flown under the radar mostly so far in this war, but I've learned that it actually has a lot of economic and strategic value. The city had a pre-war population of only about 15,000 people, which has gotten down to about 300 today. It's located 100 kilometers south of Bakhmut and 75 kilometers north of Mariupol. Volodar is positioned directly at the intersection in the Eastern Front and the Donetsk region and the Southern Front in the Zaporizhia region. The Russian-occupied city of Volnovoka is 10 miles from Volodar, which is within firing range of their artillery cannons that can fire about 15 miles away. And this is where we find the only major railway line running through and linking Crimea with the Donbass region. We know for a fact that supplies running through Crimea for Russia are vital for their war efforts. Capturing this city would make it much easier for Putin to send reinforcements and supplies to their entire front lines. Ukrainian forces have taken advantage of this situational weakness of Russia's by using Volodar's close proximity to the rail line to fire off precision artillery shells at passing Russian supply trains. This in turn has limited Russia's ability to transport manpower and armored vehicles between their two front lines. It has greatly hurt their ability to capture the Donbass region. By capturing this seemingly unimportant, tiny town of Volodar, it would give Putin free reign to send his forces along a major logistics artery all along the eastern front line. And so Zelensky's fortress-like hold on Volodar threatens Putin's land bridge through Ukraine. On top of all of this, there are two major coal mines located on the outskirts of Volodar, which are the largest coal reserves inside of Ukraine, estimated to have a combined 200 million tons of coal. This is where the city gets its name, which means gift of coal in Ukraine. According to the Ukrainian Mining Trade Union, coal constitutes 95% of Ukraine's domestic energy resource, and control of this resource is incredibly important for both sides. Most of this Ukrainian coal is used to run public utilities and for power generation within their nation. Local coal provides 50% of the country's electricity needs, with the rest having been imported from Russia and Poland in the past. The United States Environmental Protection Agency actually commissioned a report on coal resources in Volodar and Ukraine in 2010. It's since been taken down and deleted, but we can look at it through the magic of archive versions on the internet's Wayback Machine. According to this report, all the coal mines in Ukraine are owned by the state and are under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Fuel and Energy. This means Ukraine's government revenue in the past was increased by this resource, and if it's allowed to start up again, it will provide revenue for their defense industry. I think I might have found the reason as to why the Russian armed forces are repeating the same mistakes over and over again with their assaults in Kyiv failing and their same mistakes being made in Volodar. First, if we look at how the fighting started in the beginning of the war in Donbass in 2014. At the time, the city of Volodar was initially strongly fortified by Ukrainian troops, so it's been turned into a fortress of trenches and firing positions over the past eight years. The location is on a mostly empty plain, the town is elevated with a series of high-rise apartment complexes that give defenders an advantage. They can see out over the entire battlefield. Advancing Russians have to move through really tough geography that offers very little cover or concealment except for one tree line located in Pavlivka 
and the two tree lines that run the length of Volodar on the east and west. And it's safe to assume that these positions of cover have already been dialed in by Ukraine's artillery. In between those tree lines is a network of Ukrainian trenches protecting their artillery in the rear. It's really textbook defense of a city. But the significant difference here is Ukraine's 72nd Mechanized Brigade and the 55th Artillery Brigade that are stationed in Volodar are using a smart new strategy when it comes to laying their minefields. The New York Times reported that when Russian troops clear a path through one of Ukraine's old minefields, they simply fire off an artillery shell filled with remote anti-armor mine systems sent by the United States. So what does that mean? When you think of how soldiers place traditional old school Soviet era mines, they're like these heavy 20 pound giant discs that are required as a, a combat engineer to go out and get into a vulnerable position to dig them into the ground or place them there. Troops need to expose themselves to danger while laying the old minefields. The next generation RAAM mines from the US are fired from the safety of the cover of artillery cannons miles away. This is a stack of nine smaller landmines inside of a hollow 155 millimeter artillery shell that then scatters tons of these small mines across a large area. Each tiny four pound mine has a magnetic fuse set to go off when it's run over. 6,000 of these RAM munitions were donated by the United States to Ukraine. It can feel like you're being gaslighted by the enemy because you think you're just cleared an entire area and then the next day mines fall out of the sky behind you and you don't even know it. The destruction of 130 pieces of Russian armor that was destroyed or abandoned across Volodar has been attributed to this new tactic and weapon. But there's another major contributing factor here. Since 2014, the main faction fighting against Ukraine in Volodar is called the Donetsk People's Republic, and this gets us into why the same mistakes are being made over and over again by Russian troops. There are dozens of different factions fighting on the Russian side. It's not just the Russian army proper, and a lot of people don't realize it's also the LPR, it's also Wagner, it's also PMC Patriot, and even worse than that, it's each individual republic within Russia that's responsible for training and equipping many of their battalions instead of a federal training group overseeing the dissemination of knowledge like the US military trade -oc. The problem here is that each of these different various factions of Russian groups, they themselves operate under a self-sufficient mindset that doesn't promote the transfer of knowledge or the consolidation of lessons learned under some kind of unified umbrella or what we would call a standard operating procedure. So in many ways, it's not the Russian army making the same mistakes over and over again, getting blown up and advancing without artillery. It's each unit making the same mistakes on their own learning the hard way. It's important to note that different types of Russian units located in Volodar because it informs the type of tactics and strategies that we see used on the ground, since each unit fights so differently. For instance, in Bakhmut, there was famously a massive contingent of Wagner mercenaries and Russian prisoners deployed there. They used a human wave style tactic with little regard for casualties if it meant gaining more ground quicker. In Volodar, there's a stark contrast where PMC Patriot troops are deployed. PMC Patriot is a very different Russian military private contractor. They're an elite, well-trained precision unit with direct ties to the Russian defense minister, Sergei Sogu. Patriot is not expendable. They get payments of $15,800 per month and contracts that last about two months long with the most experienced former special forces soldiers. PMC Patriot has close cooperation with Russia's military intelligence service SKRU and benefits from their resources. They're actually in direct competition with Wagner Group. This was confirmed by Cherevati, a spokesman for the Eastern Group of Ukrainian Armed Forces. I'm familiar with interbranch rivalry and competition. I, I get it, you know, I make fun of US Marines for eating crayons and they make fun of us US Army soldiers for being soft and less badass. It's all in good fun because at the end of the day, our goals and training are aligned. In the various units that form the Russian allies, their incentives are not aligned. Their goals are sometimes in direct conflict with one another. As they compete for bragging rights and political power, Prigozhin is trying to capture Bakhmut so he can profit off the salt mines there, giving him more reason to go it alone at the costs of heavier losses instead of cooperating with Russian forces in a slower, safer approach. And so their reason for sharing knowledge is few and far between. In fact, a captured Russian 
Russian handbook document from the front lines shows their awful attempt to unify lessons learned in the Ukraine conflict so far. The document is titled, I Live, I Fight, I Win, which sounds like right after that it should say something like, Witness Me. The field manual's half propaganda and political talk about why you're fighting against Ukraine, and half tactical advice like keeping your vehicles 20 to 30 meters apart, and to not turn on your Russian cell phones on in theater because Ukraine can geolocate their Russian numbers within three meters by triangulating cell phone towers. But writing it in a handbook is different from training on it, and training plus equipping units is often left to the unit's home republic, which we'll get more into in a minute. The largest faction of the Russian allies fighting in Volodar is the Donetsk People's Republic. These troops are the separatists born in the Ukrainian territory who have long chosen to side with Russia. They source their own weapons, or they rely on hand-me-downs from the Russian military proper. They are not elite or as well equipped or trained as Russia's regular forces. This has led to estimates placing the DPR casualty rate at 50%, with at least 20,000 DPR soldiers being wounded or KIA as of November 2022. When the fighting started in Volodar in 2014, their force strength estimate was only at 10,000. According to the Eastern Human Rights Group, as of mid June 2022, about 140,000 Ukrainian people were forcibly mobilized into the DPR and LPR, of which 48,000 to 96,000 were sent to the front lines, the rest to logistical support. In September 2022, Russia annexed the DPR and LPR, and their paramilitary groups are now officially being integrated into Russia's military southern district which is the very first step in Russia trying to fix this problem of their hand not knowing what their foot is doing. We need to take a look at how the conditions were set. When the invasion began in 2022, Volodar was immediately targeted and hit by Russian ballistic cruise missiles carrying cluster munitions. This town was on Russia's radar from day one. Russian forces launched a massive assault on Pavlinka, directly south of Volodar, on October 28th, and Ukraine was forced to retreat from Volodar. But ever since then, Russian forces have attempted to capture the city without success so far. Russian troops were able to capture that critical town 10 miles south of Volnovaka, which has that vital railway there, and was described as one of Ukraine's major defeats because it led to the loss of Mariupol. This city has been used as a major Russian headquarters and base of operations for their attempts to seize Volodar. Major offensive operations were attempted by Russia on March 13th, July 12th, and August 27th, but it have failed so far, and the front lines have stabilized just south of Volodar for much of the war. By looking at the geography of the area, it's easy to understand why the lines have stabilized here, in part because of a natural water barrier located in front of the city, which creates a narrow choke point that Russia has to cross through. There is only one major highway, 00532, that leads directly into Volodar from Russian-occupied territory. The Russian forces are not trying to break directly through the defenses of Volodar, but are instead reportedly attempting to surround it from two different sides. Artillery shelling has plagued the city for the past year, leading to Volodar's deputy mayor saying that this city was completely destroyed, 100% of the buildings have been damaged. On January 24th of 2023, Russian forces relaunched major offensive operations in Volodar once again, and this time they were able to break through the Ukrainian troops' first line of defense just south of the town. DNR spokesmen claimed that the DPR's Kaskad Battalion had participated in the advance, along with members of Russia's 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, which led to 200 Ukrainian casualties in the battle. Ukrainian units were forced to withdraw directly into the city, but there was much more to this plan that meets the eye. What followed was 58 localized battles taking place around the perimeter of the city, with Ukrainian troops taking out over 100 Russian soldiers and wounding an additional 188 while repulsing these attacks. Geolocated footage from this time shows Russian forces were attempting to advance on tree lines at a time under fierce Ukrainian artillery fire. In early February, the Ukrainian plan became clear. They made outstanding use of their defensible depth in order to lure Russian forces into a trap. There was a Russian assault on February 6th, where about 100 Russian armored vehicles and 36 main battle tanks were destroyed by Ukrainian artillery that had already dialed in coordinates and monitored the kill zone with drones. 
They then laid minefields behind Russian formations with those ram mines. The Ukrainian commander of the 72nd said that the Ukrainian tanks would fire on the inexperienced Russian drafted tank crews, which would immediately retreat and run into the landmines that had been fired by artillery behind them, creating pure chaos. Another new strategy used was laying minefields on the shoulders right off the road so that it would lure Russian tanks down the road, who then performed their classic move of driving off the road to take cover when they took fire. This would drive them directly into the mines. The Ukrainians also made use of their American M777 and French Caesar howitzer artillery and javelin missile launchers in Volodar. Video and photographic evidence from the battle revealed the extent of the Russian armor which was destroyed and it showed their markings in Volodar, confirming the reports that 130 vehicles had been destroyed. In an interview by RFE, they spoke with relatives of the soldiers who were KIA in the battle and it sheds a lot of light on why Russia's continuing to make the same mistakes in battles that they were making a year ago. Many of the Russian soldiers who were KIA in the attacks in Volodar were Tatar volunteers from the Alga Battalion. That's from Tataristan, a predominantly Muslim region in one of Russia's most poorest districts in the entire country. And yet funding for this battalion came not from the Russian Federation, but from Tataristan itself. Rob Lee posted video footage of the Alga Battalion enlisting and training and being sent to Ukraine in June of 2022. Each volunteer reportedly receives about $2,250 per month. The majority of Russia's 72nd Motor Rifle Brigade is made up of these Tatars. The reason I bring up all of these different Russian factions fighting in Ukraine is because this is more evidence that there appears to be no unified distribution of knowledge inside of their military. There is no lessons learned by the DPR, which is shared by the lessons learned by the Wagner forces and PMC Patriot, which is codified into some kind of standard operating procedure. But don't take my word for it. This is what pro-Russian telegram channels themselves are saying in an attempt to be self-critical and improve their operations. The Grey Zone is a quasi-official telegram channel of Wagner mercenaries and they posted that disaster was unfolding around Volodar, and it is unfolding again and again. They blame the crisis in troop command for sending their offensive in without cover of artillery fire. What's happening with this lack of artillery covering fire? The problem is that Russia's field communication networks are too unreliable to allow for coordination on the battlefield. Russian commanders are often unable to share information between their recon drones and artillery units, so they instead decide to just fire away trying to level the ground in front of them with a hope and a prayer of hitting something. This was not efficient. Estimates say that approximately 60,000 rounds of artillery fire was sent out by the Russian forces per day earlier in the war. Most of those munitions did not find their target. On top of the tremendous volume of fire, the hardware itself is not designed to take that kind of beating. So Russian artillery pieces are warping and falling apart, which puts more pressure on their logistics supply lines. But as we mentioned before, they're unable to safely transport those new artillery pieces with ease along that railroad. This has led to Russian artillery fire dropping by reportedly 75% from their wartime high down to 20,000 rounds per day. They could very well find a way to turn that around in the future, but as it stands, it's a problem for them. And so they all learn the hard way. When I deployed to Iraq, there were a ton of different various coalition allied forces that were fighting against insurgents in Iraq under different banners. There was our regular infantry brigade, there was elite special forces units, there were British soldiers. I was stationed at a small outpost alongside Iraqi police and Iraqi army units, but we were all using the same knowledge base when it came to the best practices for countering the opposing forces. Russia's various factions are not communicating with each other and are all very proud of being self-sufficient fighting forces, each of them competing with each other instead of cooperating. There must be no incentive to cooperate. I imagine there's a lot of incentive to compete and not share knowledge because each group wants to claim a victory and use that victory to advance their own political status with Putin. The Ukrainian military intelligence chief shared his thoughts on Russia's ability to turn the war around with raw manpower, stating that 90% of the 316,000 mobilized Russian soldiers had been deployed inside of Ukraine. There is such an excess of light infantry and all of their vehicles are being destroyed that they've shifted to on-foot assaults instead of mechanized maneuvers. 
The slowdown of attacks in early March could be because the weather conditions are starting to prevent the ability for tracked vehicles to move, as the temperature is now rising above freezing in Ukraine, and the thaw is leading to the infamous muddy season conditions. The intelligence chief also stated that he believed the Kremlin's objective of manufacturing 800 tanks per year is unrealistic, and stated that Russia can only produce 40 cruise missiles per month. That's enough for about one single round of missile strikes. But it's important to keep in mind, there is still the possibility that Russia's newly mobilized 300,000 recruits and soldiers and an additional 200,000 soldiers from other various militia groups and factions and aid from Iran could be enough raw manpower and materials to overcome these massive losses on the battlefield. This is just my opinion, my thoughts, and the research I've done. I'm very interested to know why do you guys think the Russian military is making the same tactical blunders a year later when they should be learning from their mistakes in the past by now. Either way, we're all praying that this war ends soon. Thank you for watching. I've been your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and I'll see you guys real soon.